morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on a rainy Sunday morning. I'm glad to have you guys all here. Um, my name is Stephanie Harris. I'm the Massachusetts State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. We're the nation's largest animal protection organization. We have state directors in about 45 of the 50 states, and um, we exist to tackle the most systemic problems for animals. Um, I wanted to take a minute to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, if you ever want to reach me, here's my contact information, Stephanie Harris. Um, and here is a little bit of background about me. So I started off in, um, after college, I studied political science, and I started off in program management, which obviously is not what I do today. Um, I pretty quickly realized that wasn't what I wanted to be doing. I have a political science background, but I've also always been a tremendous animal lover. And so I pretty quickly transitioned into actually working at a wildlife rescue and rehabilitation facility, hence the squirrel photo. Um, and then after my time there, I uh, had the privilege of working as an intern for the Humane Society of the United States. And um, I was based at our headquarters in Maryland, and I worked on a lot of different issues there. I was in our wildlife protection department. Um, but one of the issues I spent the most amount of time working on was fox penning. So fox penning involves um, captured uh, foxes and coyote and using dogs to chase them. It's not something we do in New England, but it is a big issue or has been a really big issue in Virginia. And so you have this lovely photo of me dressed up as a hound um, <laughs> at the Virginia State Capitol. Um, and after my time as an intern with the Wildlife Protection Department, I moved up to Portland, Maine, and I was the campaign manager of Mainers for Fair Bear Hunting, which was a ballot initiative to protect bears, to prohibit um, the cruel use of dogs, traps, and bait. Um, and so this is a photo from my time up there. And now here I am in Massachusetts serving as our state director. Um, it's truly a privilege of mine to be in this role. I've been doing it for the last couple of years um, and I absolutely adore it. Um, some of you have probably heard about the, um, the cruelty case in uh, Wolfboro, New Hampshire. So that's a photo of me with one of the Great Dane puppies from up there. Um, and then this is a photo of me at the State House um, giving a Humane Legislator Award to Senator Mike more from the Worcester area. So I would like to take a moment before we delve into more of the background on the Humane Society of the United States and the work that um, we're doing across the country and here in Massachusetts to go around the room and learn a little bit about each of you and what brought you out today. Um, so uh, can we start over on this corner, please? Sure. Yes. Hi, I'm Brenda. Um, I've been a supporter of APAC and was on the board for a while and a long time volunteer. So. Hi, I'm Julie. Uh, I've been a supporter of Big Cat for about five years. I was a staff member at one point, and, um, and now I just continue as a volunteer. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lizzie. Um, I moved over to the US a few months ago, and then quickly found Bay Park. Um, so I volunteer there with the dogs, and have started fostering as well. So I've got a lovely arm of the greyhound at the moment. Oh, Hi, my name is Julie McMahon, and I'm a volunteer for BayPad, and uh, I enjoy it. It's a really self-seeking, uh, rewarding to be with the animals. I, what I do, I started out as a dog walker. I developed vertigo, so I had to put myself someplace up. So I go out and grab all the donations for the fur ball. So I go around <laughs> knocking on doors. <laughs> I want to pay that. <laughs> and I love you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It's really, Thank you for um, really exciting to be here. I appreciate it so much. I'm Angela. I'm a volunteer at Bay Path, and I'm going through the FEMA training in hopes of someday being part of a humane rescue organization. I'm Suzanne. I'm a supporter of both Bay Path and the Humane Society, and I thought it would be kind of nice to put them both together and see what I could learn. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kristen Fitzpatrick. I'm on the board at Bay Path as their uh, HR specialist. I'm Lisa. I am friends with Kristen. I have two rescue dogs, so she knows I'm, I'm interested in this. Um, so that's how I found out about it. I'm Linda, and I've been a long time volunteer at Bay Path. And I love animals, and I support a number of organizations. I'm Marie, a lifelong animal lover, um, volunteer at Bay Path for the past couple of years, and I work with both cats and dogs, and I have rescues. 
Carol, and I volunteer at APAS, and I love both cats and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Paul Wright. I've worked with Bay Path for more than 35 years, I think, before they had a shelter. We helped build the shelter and have uh, been involved on and off for many years. Thank you. I'm Leslie. I'm a dog foster for Bay Path. Hi, I'm Tracy, and I have two rescue dogs at home. It's something I've been passionate about my whole life. I volunteer at Bay Path now as a dog walker, and I'm just interested to get more involved and learn how Susan. Um, I've done some life um, volunteering for Bay Path. We have four cats and a dog and they're all rescues. And um, I'm a mom, but my, my girls are older now, so I'm looking forward to you know, using my time to help animals. Hi, my name's Jess. I've been volunteering at Bay Path for about a year or so. Um, fostering for over four, and I love it. And I'm just curious to learn about how to help more animals. So. Okay, everybody? Thank you. Now, I just want to, just if you could just shout out one of the reasons why you're here today, what you're most hoping to learn. Just anything. Put you on the spot, I know, early morning. <laughs> yeah. Just kind of the bigger picture. Okay. I mean, we see one organization and I, you know, contribute to the main society, so I would like to learn a little bit more about them and also just maybe different ways of being involved. Great, thank you. Yeah, well, I'm excited to talk to you a lot more about that. Great. All right, well, we'll get started. Um, so this here has a ton of information on it, but it gives you an idea of the breadth of the Humane Society of the United States, the scope of our work. We work on all animal issues, so not just cats and dogs, not just companion animals. We work on wildlife issues, farm animal issues, animals and research, wildlife, the list just goes on and on. And we were founded to tackle um, systemic cruelty, to address these changes on a very large scale. Um, so it is not our role to duplicate the wonderful work that local shelters and rescues are doing, which is so important and so needed, um, but we are here to complement that work. Um, not just by working on um, local and state and federal legislation, but also by providing a lot of resources. Um, we are grateful for all of the shelters and rescues in our network, and so we like to um, do as much as we can to provide resources, information, um, to folks um, that are um, leading, leading the country. Um, and that, that really is our shelters and rescues here in Massachusetts and in New England. Um, the work that you all are doing is incredible, life-saving work, and I'm so grateful to all of you. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have been to our Animal Care Expo, but it's our annual um, expo on animal sheltering and rescue, and it's a phenomenal opportunity to get more involved, to meet your um, compatriots from across the country and really across the world. We bring people in um, internationally to this incredible event. I, I was um, lucky enough, fortunate enough, to be able to go this past year, um, and it was absolutely mind-blowing, the amount of information um, and resources that were available to folks that were there. So this year's um, expo is out in Missouri, and um, we 
would love to see some of you there. It's a, it's a truly tremendous opportunity. Um, we have animalshelteringorg which is um, a resource for shelters and rescues throughout the country and around the world um, that provides uh, an in-depth look at what's working in certain parts of the country, what um, you know, features on, on certain um, opportunities that specific shelters and rescues have had, uh, and, and delves really deeply into um, ways to professionalize this field. I gave out copies of Animal Sheltering Magazine. If you didn't get some, there are some more up front, so you can get a taste of that magazine. Um, here are some other examples of resources that we have available to shelters and rescues. Um, the Shelter Pet Project is an incredible resource, an incredible site, um, and it's one of my favorite places to direct people that are interested in getting more involved because it has a really easy way to find um, your local shelter and rescue, which obviously you all know, but I um, get requests for that information from folks all around the state, and so there's a really easy zip code search. It's a good way to find ways to get more involved as a volunteer here, but also if you're looking to adopt, it's a good place to find uh, an animal near to you. And of course, we also have our emergency placement partner program, of which Bay Path is one of our uh, partnering shelters. And so we um, utilize a network of shelters and rescues throughout the country um, when there are larger scale uh, disasters, puppy mill um, hoarding cases, things of that nature, where there are a large number of animals that need to be placed. Um, an example of the emergency placement partners work recently was um, in advance of the uh, some of the natural disasters that struck when we had that warning, like in Texas. Um, we worked with the shelters and rescues in the state to move out the animals that were already adoptable to make room for animals that had been displaced by the disaster so that those animals would be near to their owners, to their families um, when the disaster had ended and they could be um, reunited with those families. So thank you to Baypath for joining us as an emergency placement partner. Um, the Humane Society does provide direct care for animals in some circumstances, although as I talked about before, our primary goal is to address these examples of systemic cruelty, but we do have um, a number of facilities throughout the United States, including those that are listed here. At South Florida Wildlife Center is the um, nation's largest wildlife rehabilitation and rescue facility, and they do amazing work. Um, when Animal Care Expo was down in Florida uh, this past year, I had the opportunity to take a tour of the South Florida Wildlife Center, and it is truly an incredible facility. If you ever get down to the area, I would highly recommend um, trying to visit. Um, we have other sanctuaries in Texas, in California, and Oregon, um, and, and they do incredible work. The Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association is a network of veterinarians and veterinary students um, across the country and the world that are um, interested in um, the, uh, the welfare of animals and that want to stay engaged, especially in advocacy work. So those are partners that we've been able to tap into when um, we're working on leg state legislation and when we're working on things like ballot initiatives. If um, you were all here in Massachusetts for the 2016 election, you probably remember question three on the ballot. So um, thankfully we had uh, hundreds of veterinarians endorse that ballot initiative um, and it's it's a true pleasure to work with these experts. Um, we have a number of resources available for law enforcement as well, and we have staff that are specifically dedicated to providing training. They travel all across the country um, to do these law enforcement trainings. Um, and we're in the early stages of um, planning potentially bringing some of them into Massachusetts, which could be really exciting. So here's what I've been talking about from the beginning is we, we take on these massive industries, people that are really, industries that are really invested in animals um, purely from a monetary perspective. So that's puppy mills, that's factory farms, um, the wildlife trade, those massive industries. And because we take on those industries, um, we take a lot of fire from them. Um, and so you can see more of, um, uh, more of, uh, about um, the, uh, more to um, combat those claims that are made against us at whoattackshsus.org. So it's a really great resource. So now to delve a little bit more into what we're doing here in Massachusetts. Here are just a few photos from uh, my time here in Massachusetts. 
Um, you can see in the upper right corner, or your left corner, pardon, um, upper left corner, that's a photo from our lobby day. So along with the MSPCA and the Animal Rescue League of Boston and the ASPCA, we have for years been hosting an annual lobby day at the State House. Have any of you been able to make it to that before? Maybe, yeah. Um, so at Lobby Day, um, we are really focused on our state legislative priorities. And so we talk a lot about what bills are pending, um, how they've moved, if they have moved through the legislative process, what the history of those bills are, because some of them have been around for a number of years. And it gives all of the advocates an opportunity to, as best we can schedule, meet with their state lawmakers, so your state senator and your state representative. It's a really incredible event, and we've been lucky enough to have massive out for the last several years. Um, you can see one of those sit-down meetings with a, a state legislator that's um, Representative Lori Ehrlich in the upper right-hand corner. Um, she is a true champion for animals. She's um, based out of Marblehead, and she is the lead sponsor on numerous animal protection uh, bills this legislative session, as she always is. Um, there's a photo of me in the bottom corner doing a media <coughs> interview um, during the ballot question, um, the Citizens for Farm Animal Protection Initiative. It was my uh, privilege to serve as the campaign director as well as the state director for HSUS throughout that ballot initiative process. And then in the bottom corner, and we'll delve a little bit more into this a little bit later, that's um, an, a still image from um, undercover investigation that we did into the ivory trade in Massachusetts. And so you can see here that that um, is labeled as bone. And we heard, our investigators heard from sellers that they deliberately um, mislabel ivory as bone because people in Massachusetts are put off by ivory. Here's um, a slide that highlights some of our recent victories uh, in Massachusetts, and these are just 2016 alone. Um, so in 2016, uh, thanks to people like you, um, the Question 3 campaign passed at the ballot overwhelmingly with 78% of the vote. That is um, the, the uh, most overwhelmingly approved animal ballot initiative in history. And this is also the, um, the nation's strongest farm animal protection law that we were able to pass. And so what this, uh, this law says is that, um, that uh, for meat, eggs, and, and uh, meat and eggs that are produced or sold in the Commonwealth, they have to come from facilities that give animals enough space to stand up, lie down, turn around, and extend their limbs. So it's a very modest requirement, but it is uh, incredible um, the amount of change that this is driving. Um, during the course of this two-year ballot initiative, um, more than 100 companies pledged to go cage-free, and that was because of the pressure that they were facing because of this ballot initiative. So thank you to all of you who voted yes on question three, um, anyone who gathered signatures. I am truly, truly grateful to you for doing that. I spent a lot of my time working on initiative petitions. Um, I mentioned before that I worked in Maine on the uh, Mainers for Fair Bear Hunting campaign, but I also worked on Keep Michigan Wolves Protected in Michigan for a while, and so I've spent a lot of time out <laughs> gathering signatures and know the back aching work that goes into it, um, and was really excited to take on that opportunity here in Massachusetts. I knew that that was up on the horizon when I took this position, and I really couldn't be more grateful for to the people of Massachusetts, especially animal lovers like you, for really making history that day. It was incredible. Um, a couple of the other victories we've had in 2016. Um, you can see in the adorable photo with the puppy in the bottom right corner, gum, that is Gumdrop. And you can see in the background, um, she's uh, taking the stage, um, stealing the show from all of our state lawmakers and the governor. That was at our bill signing for the Hot Cars Tethering and Citation Bill. Um, so that bill uh, requires that um, dogs cannot be kept on a tether for too long a time. Previously, um, the law had said that they couldn't be tethered for more than 24 hours at a time, and this decreases that amount of time, because essentially, if it says not more than 24 hours, in theory, you could just <coughs> click them off the tether for 30 seconds and then click them back on, and that's still not more than 24 hours. Plus, the enforcement um, abilities are seriously hindered with 24 hours, because you can't just sit and watch for 24 hours to see if they do, in fact, click off and click back on. So this requires much more um, limited amounts of time that a dog can spend on a tether and uh, prohibits leaving a dog on a tether or outdoor in another um, enclosure during inclement weather. So there's a specific prohibition in place for that. 
Um, beyond the tethering piece, it addressed the issue of uh, pets in hot cars or cold cars. Um, so really it says that, um, that uh, first responders can rescue an animal um, that's in danger and under certain circumstances, so can a good Samaritan. And then the final piece was of, it, of it was giving our animal um, control officers and humane law enforcement officers with the MSPCA and Animal Rescue League of Boston another tool in their toolbox. Um, previously, they've been able to issue essentially warnings and bring felony cruelty charges, but there wasn't a lot of middle ground. And so this gave them citation authority over some of our um, animal laws in Massachusetts. And then another of our 2016 victories, that's the photo that's uh, over on the left side, that's um, Representative Linda Dean Campbell at the MSPCA's Methuen location, um, celebrating the um, signing of that bill into law. And so um, that's a cost of animal care law. So if um, animals are, it updated our cost of animal care. We already had one on the books, thankfully, um, which uh, for those of you who have been following the Wolfboro case in New Hampshire, unfortunately they didn't, which is why um, you may say the United States was uh, one of the many reasons why we stepped in and um, are, are providing care for these animals for the duration of this court case um, and the investigation and the case is because there is no cost of animal care law there and so the town would be um, responsible for funding the care of these animals during the investigation and the case um, which is, is essentially impossible it's enough to bankrupt a small town um, so HSUS was glad to be able to step in and, and, and care for those animals. And we're grateful for those of you, if any of you have been, some of the volunteers that have been trucking up, there have been a lot of folks from Massachusetts that have gone up to volunteer at our um, emergency shelter. If any of you are interested in it, stay, chat with me a little bit. We've got um, an application process if you haven't had a chance to go up yet. Um, and uh, it's a, it's an, it, it makes it an incredible difference when you have a cost of animal care law in place. And our um, New Hampshire State <coughs> Director, Lindsay Hamrick, has um, been doing incredible work uh, in the wake of that, the, the tragedy that um, we saw unfolding in Wolfboro um, in making sure that they pass humane legislation, including a cost of animal care law. And she's got commitments from some key lawmakers, key decision makers in New Hampshire to make that a reality. Yeah, so um, cost of animal care laws uh, make sure that um, when an animal is seized in a cruelty case, that the abuser is held responsible for covering the cost of care. They should or would be providing for, um, would be covering the cost of food and veterinary care in that time if they were, in theory, to still have control over this animal. So this just shifts that burden um, from the, the, um, the town to the abuser. Um, potentially, but it, it also can allow for um, a town like, you know, like potentially Wolfboro to, um, to, to, to manage this type of situation on their own. I mean, especially in New England, we have this phenomenal network of shelters and rescues, and um, ordinarily they might be able to take on, um, you know, divvying up responsibility for those animals among the local shelters and rescues, but with such a large scale case and the incredible amount of um, resources that have to go in, into it, especially financially, um, it was untenable in the whole borough, but it could be under, if you have a, um, a strong cost of animal care law. Could be, yeah. We took in a, a dog from, I think it was 18 dogs in that case. It went on for 16 months. Mm -hmm. and, and people don't think about like the, the, yeah, the legal end and how that drags out, and you know, we took care of him. And I, I don't know if there was, a, I don't know if we ever had to pay for the care, but you know, we did it. You know, and a lot of other shelters stepped up too. But yeah. you forget that whole like that part drags on, where they still technically own the animal, mm -hmm. and you can't neuter them and you can't do anything. Interesting. That's good. Yeah, so we strengthened it. Thankfully, we already had a cost of animal care law um, in place in Massachusetts, but this um, strengthened it even more and um, made it a little bit clearer what could happen. But in New Hampshire, it's, it's critical to pass legislation like this. So just to chat briefly about the legislative process, unless anybody has any questions to this point, we can take every moment to answer any more of those if anybody has any. Okay, so... Um, we have 200 legislators in Massachusetts, state legislators. Um, there are 160 representatives in the House, and there are 40 senators in the Senate. 
Um, and you can see the breakdown of Democrats to Republicans here, 126 to 34 in the House of Representatives and 34 to 6 in the Senate. So that means we are a, um, we have a super majority of Democrats here in Massachusetts. Um, however, animal protection issues are typically um, they don't, they don't uh, fall down party lines. Um, these are truly issues that people, everyone can get behind. We see that here in Massachusetts, but also we see that often at the federal level as well. Um, so to walk through a little bit of the timeline of our legislative process in Massachusetts, we have a two-year legislative session. So it begins in January of the odd year and continues through the end of December of the even year. So we began in January 2017, and uh, this legislative session will end in the end of December of 2018. So it's a longer legislative session. There are some other states that have a session this long. Um, but a lot of states have just a, um, just a year-long process or even a portion of a year, or they'll have um, one year and um, on and then the next year will be maybe just a budget session so it'll be shorter every seat is pretty different um, but I'll you know, run through what it um, what it looks like here in Massachusetts so the bill filing deadline is in January of the first uh, first year of the two-year legislative session and so what that means is in advance of that deadline um, organizations are working with state legislators to file the bills so you're collaborating with them to draft language um, and get that formally filed in the state house. And so um, for us, that means working really closely with the MSPCA and the Animal Rescue League of Boston, who both have staff that work exclusively on, the, on legislative issues. Um, and uh, working with them to uh, assess what our priorities are for each legislative session and then who we think our strongest allies are on these different issues. And a lot of our issues in Massachusetts have been around for a number of years, so we have these tremendous champions in place already. And so we're refiling legislation that's been around for a while. Maybe there are some tweaks to the language based on things that have changed in the last two years, since that's usually the last time it would have been filed. So it gives you a chance to update things if they haven't passed that legislative session. And it's, it's fairly common for um, legislation to take multiple sessions to become, to be passed into law. Um, it's, I, I think six years is pretty standard. Yeah, so it's a lengthy process. It, it's not always the case. Some things pass in one legislative session. Um, shark finning, for example, passed in 2014, and that was one session and done, which is phenomenal, but that's, um, that's the exception, usually, not the rule. Um, after a bill has been filed, uh, there is a process by which the bill is assigned to a certain issue-specific committee. So the committees that our bills typically get assigned to are uh, the Joint Committee on Environment, Natural Resources, and Agriculture, the Joint Committee on Municipalities and Regional Government, Sometimes the joint commission, uh, excuse me, the joint committee on the judiciary. Um, it varies from session to session. They don't necessarily always go to the same committees from one session to the next. Um, so sometimes there are surprises in store there, uh, but sometimes they do. Sometimes there's some continuity, and that means that uh, from one session to the next, the committee members, especially the committee chairs, if they remain the same, they become more familiar with um, your particular issue, and so that can be helpful um, because they have a reference point and they know how potentially how that bill has changed over time. Um, we have here in Massachusetts joint committees, so that means there are senators and representatives that serve on the committee. So there's a House chair and a Senate chair of each of these joint committees. And they have committee hearings, um, and they have a certain amount of time to hold those committee hearings um, and to make determinations on bills. And so that's what that Joint Rule 10 deadline is. That's the deadline by which the committees must have heard a bill that was filed timely, so that was filed by that deadline. There is a process to file bills after for the deadline, um, but it doesn't. It, it means that that bill is not guaranteed a public hearing, and that is one of the things that sets Massachusetts apart: is that every bill that is filed in a timely manner is guaranteed a public hearing. So that means that all of you have an opportunity to speak out on any of these animal protection uh, pieces of legislation. So you have the opportunity to come to the state house. Occasionally, hearings are held throughout the Commonwealth, but usually they're held at the state house, um, and to go and to speak. And committees usually give everyone three minutes per bill. Um, it varies from committee to committee how they run their, their um, how the chairs run their committee. Um, some will uh, be um, more liberal with their time than others. 
Um, and sometimes when there are a lot of bills that are assigned to a specific committee, um, they might allow three minutes per person, even if there are multiple animal bills or whatever the issue is, you're there for bills in that committee. So it does vary from one committee to the next and one hearing to the next based on how full the agenda is. Um, Joint Rule 10 deadline, as I mentioned, is that deadline by which the committees must make a determination on that bill. So the most common determinations, uh, well, overwhelmingly the most common is probably that it gets sent to study, which is essentially um, a quiet way to kill a bill. It basically means that it needs more consideration, um, but it's unlikely that that consideration is going to be taken up during the rest of that legislative process. It's not unheard of for it to happen, but it's, um, it typically means the end of that issue for that legislative session. Um, hopefully, if it's a bill that we support, it will receive a favorable report. And so after the committee hearing process, a committee may hold an executive session where they vote on the bill or they might um, sub uh, circulate a, an electronic poll to the members of the committee on that issue. And so if it's, a, if it's a bill that we support, then we're seeking a yes vote within that committee. And if it receives um, a sufficient number of yes votes in that committee, then it will receive a favorable report. Um, and so those are usually the most common things that can happen. Um, it is possible for a bill to receive an unfavorable report, but it's a little bit rarer for that to happen. Um, and uh, we do obviously seek that when there are bills that we oppose because um, my role in, in um, the state legislature uh, as well as the other state directors throughout the country is to not only fight for animal protection laws but also to fight against laws that would do harm to animals and even in a, an incredible state for animals like Massachusetts we do have those bills and I'll talk a little bit more about what some of those are in a little bit. Um, after uh, after a period of time in the two-year legislative process, um, there we shift to having informal sessions rather than formal sessions. And so during the informal session period of time, um, that is when only non-controversial bills can pass because if, um, if a bill is taken up during a formal session by either the Senate or the House of Representatives, it's a simple majority that it needs to pass. If it's taken up during an informal session in either chamber, the Senate or the House of Representatives, then it only needs one voice of opposition to kill the issue. So typically only non-controversial issues are able to pass after that point. So it gives you a little bit of a sense of what our legislative process is like. It's a long and slow process, um, and a lot of our bills have been around for, for many, many years. But like I said, they change over time. So let's see, how are we doing on time? So it's 10.30 now. Um, let's, uh, I'm gonna pick just a few of these issues, or actually I'll have you guys pick a few of the issues. I'm gonna run through um, what some of our state priority bills are now, and then let's just do a quick poll on which ones we wanna delve most into, because there's a lot of them. I wanna be sensitive to folks' time, um, and we can always circle back if we've got more time at the end to delve more deeply into all of them. All right, so I'll run through what some of them are now. Uh, so on the wildlife front, this legislative session, here are a few of our priority issues. We've got a bill to uh, prevent poaching, and it does that by um, <coughs> increasing penalties for poaching. Poaching is the illegal killing or harming of wildlife, and also by entering Massachusetts into a nationwide law enforcement network that's already benefiting 48 other states. Um, another of the issues is to ban the use of elephants in circuses and traveling shows. Um, you probably are all familiar with the fact that Ringling has shuttered its doors. Um, however, there are a lot of uh, smaller shows that are still traveling around the country and including shows that are stopping here in Massachusetts. Um, ivory and rhino horn trafficking. So this is a bill to prohibit the trade um, with some exceptions. Um, and then plastic bag proliferation. Um, some of you might have uh, been following the trend of uh, localities in Massachusetts. We're over 60, I think now, um, that have passed uh, single-use plastic bag bills. And so we have that issue at the state level as well as on the local level. Um, for animal cruelty, there's PAWS 2. So PAWS 1, um, protecting animal welfare and safety, uh, was a bill that passed a number of years ago, and a por portion of that bill created a legislatively appointed task force 
um, called the Animal Cruelty and Protection Task Force. And they met for about 18 months and provided a number of recommendations to the state, including some legislative recommendations. So we took those legislative recommendations along with MSPCA and Laura Spook of Boston and um, created this piece of legislation. So it's an omnibus bill. So it has a lot of different pieces to it. Um, another issue that we're working on in Massachusetts is uh, an overhaul of our bestiality statute, so it's animal sexual abuse. Um, our statute is uh, very antiquated currently. Companion animals, here are some of the issues we're focusing on this legislative session. So we have a puppies and kittens bill, which addresses um, puppy mill issues to a certain extent, and also addresses some of the higher volume local breeders um, by putting in place some common sense regulations. Um, also, um, requiring landlords to check abandoned property for, uh, or vacant property for abandoned animals under certain circumstances, and breed-based insurance discrimination, so to prohibit homeowners and renters insurance companies from discriminating based on the breed of dogs that a policy owner has. And to animal research issues, we have a couple of priority bills this legislative session. These are new issues in Massachusetts. Um, so one would require that at a, um, the end of an animal's term in research, so a cat or dog, um, that they be made available for adoption if they are um, fit for adoption. And then the other is to um, require the use of alternatives to animal testing when there are approved alternatives available. And that's um, explicitly for product testing, um, not biomedical research. Um, so product testing is things like cosmetics, household cleaners, things of that nature. And then farm animals, um, for, we have a uh, bill pending that would give um, some citation authority to our animal control officers, as well as humane law enforcement with MSPCA and Animal Rescue League of Boston, similar to what we did last session, but this expands um, that citation authority to farm animals. And then um, here are some of the bills that we are currently fighting in Massachusetts. There's a dangerous puppy bill bill, um, and uh, there is a bill to um, create a livestock board, um, which is essentially an una a politically unaccountable board that could potentially um, undo some of the standards that we've set for farm animals um, and, and, and work to maintain the status quo forevermore, potentially. Um, and then also there's always a suite of bills that are filed every legislative session that would repeal protections that were established in the Wildlife Protection Act um, about 20 years ago in 1986. Uh, and so we always fight those um, efforts to repeal those cruel hunting and trapping methods, or ex repeal the restrictions on them, pardon. Okay, so I know that's a lot of issues, which is why maybe we can pick just a few to delve into more deeply. Um, let's do a poll um, of the wildlife issues. Let's pick one or two of the wildlife issues to focus on. So um, we can just do hands up for this. So who wants to talk about the poaching bill? Okay. Um, what about elephants and circuses? All right, I feel like this is going to be a close vote on all of them. Um, ivory and rhino horn? Okay. <laughs> okay, and plastic bags? All right, all right. Um, so it was definitely close. I think that there were more people that were interested in the plastic bag issue and in the poaching issue, so we'll start there, but we can circle back. Um, so for poaching, um, this bill's been around for six years. <coughs> Um, and it, as I mentioned before, it does two things. It would increase or modernize our penalties for poaching, some of which are outdated by about a century. Um, it basically brings our poaching penalties in line with our neighbors so that people don't see our penalties as just a slap on the wrist. So it's worth coming to Massachusetts because, oh, it's not that big a deal. The, you know, the fines aren't that significant. Um, and then the other piece of it is entering Massachusetts into this nationwide law enforcement network. So it's called the Inter uh, Interstate Wildlife Violator Compact. It's been benefiting other state agencies for more than 25 years. As of now, there are 48 states that are already members of this network. Um, it's a really common sense network. It gives us essentially access to a database of poachers. 
So if someone has been convicted of a poaching crime in another state and they apply for a hunting, fishing, or trapping license here in Massachusetts, we can look them up in this database if they have committed a crime and we have a reciprocal crime on the books with a similar penalty of a license suspension or license revocation, then we can choose to reciprocate and deny or cancel a license. So there's still some flexibility on our end and it really only applies when there is a reciprocal crime. So if we don't have something similar to another state or vice <coughs> versa, then it doesn't apply. But it gives us access to this information and allows us to make a more informed decision about who we're issuing um, these privileges to, these hunting, fishing, and trapping privileges. Um, the, the, some of the, um, the penalties that this um, increases in particular are penalties for thrill killing, which is essentially when a number of animals are killed at once, um, usually a large number of animals. Sometimes you see that in instances um, of road hunting, which is another crime, but they often go hand in hand. So, um, so one of the more common instances is uh, when someone is driving basically by a field of deer and they just gun down all the animals deer in the field and then leave their carcasses. That's the other piece of it. Is there's, there's, no, um, there's no fair chase to this. There's no harvesting of the, the animal. Um, you're really just doing it for the thrill of it. And sometimes there's also alcohol involved, which is yet another crime. Um, and so uh, this is an incredibly important piece of legislation because there are 48 member states and we are not one of them. We're not benefiting. The other state that is a non-member is Hawaii. And if you think about the way this compact works, um, this, this will do so much good for us because we share our borders with so many other states. So it's a really important piece of legislation for us to pass. Um, our lead sponsor on this on the Senate side is Senator Mike Moore. He's a former environmental police officer. He's been working on this issue for six years um, with us and other partners in this, um, in this effort. And, uh, on the House side, um, Representative Ehrlich that you saw the photo of earlier from Marblehead, um, she's one of our lead sponsors, and this is actually a rare instance where we have multiple lead sponsors in one chamber. Usually we find one um, lead sponsor in the Senate and one in the House, but in this case, um, the, the legislation has stalled out on the House side for the last several years. It's always passed the Senate, um, and then it's gotten hung up in the House, which is not too, too uncommon. There's a one committee in particular that has a reputation for bills getting hung up there. But um, one of the things that we've been working on is to really grow the awareness of this issue on the House side. And so as a result, there was a lot of interest in the bill at the beginning of this legislative session. And so in addition to Representative Lori Ehrlich, um, Representatives Corey Atkins and Representative Margaret uh, and Margaret Ferrante are also lead sponsors on the House. And so they represent um, coastal districts and uh, a good mix of, of districts and the type of types of poaching that they've seen, um, because it is another um, one of the types of poaching we see here in Massachusetts is poaching of marine species, and that is very significant um, inland. Uh, and marine, um, all of it is a, is a serious issue. And it is happening here in Massachusetts, it's happening in every state um, across the country and everywhere in, in the world. Um, law enforcement estimates that for every animal that's legally harvested, another animal is poached. So this is a, this is a, um, a big issue. And we see uh, about a thousand instances um, uh, per year of poaching if you get the data from um, fisheries and wildlife. What kind of animals are being poached? I mean, uh, the majority of Deer or the green light? Yeah, it's, it, it runs the gamut, really. Um, sometimes it's deer, um, sometimes it's black bear, um, sometimes it's uh, endangered species. We've seen that, unfortunately. Um, some of it is fish and marine fish um, and shellfish, uh, which is really, um, can be really harmful to our commercial fisheries and our fishing industry here in Massachusetts. And all of it's problematic because, um, you know, our our fishing game sets these limits for the, the animals that can be harvested based on how those populations are doing. And so when people are taking these animals illegally, those things aren't taken into consideration. And right now, our penalties and the fact that we're not members of this compact, um, we're not able to do enough to deter people from poaching because they know they can come here. And even if they come here and get caught poaching, um, even if they lose their license in Massachusetts, that is not reported back to their home state. There's no reciprocity. Um, and by entering the compact, we can provide that reciprocity, which is a really significant deterrent. Yeah. Like with this bill specifically, in being a coastal state, do you, is there like a group of 
commercial fishermen that speak up? Like, do they come to the table on this kind of thing too? To um, speak up? So we've been working with um, Trout Unlimited as one of the fishing groups that has been really supportive of this. And this is an issue that we have tremendous support for. We've never heard anyone um, speak out in opposition to this bill at the public hearings, which is fairly unusual. Usually there's at least some opposition to our bills. Um, but yeah, this is one where animal welfare advocates, um, wildlife rehabilitators, sportsmen all come to the table and they want, and environmental organizations, the Sierra Clubs um, is a supporter of this issue. Um, really, they all come together for this. And so um, we're hopeful that this legislative session we can get this done yeah so why is it that it would take six years to <laughs> is it just back up uh, that is the question um, so it's not uncommon for things to take this long um, for folks to get a certain comfort level with an issue um, but it's difficult to say why this one hasn't passed in particular um, it has for the last uh, several legislative sessions been uh, assigned to the Environment Committee, the Environment, Natural Resources, and Agriculture. It has been reported out favorably by that committee, and then it's gone to, it's the Senate version that's usually been reported out, and so that's then gone on to the full Senate, where it's passed unanimously. Um, and then it moves over to the House side. And in the House, it's historically gotten hung up in a committee called the House Committee on Ways and Means. Um, there's a new chairman of that committee this session, and so hopefully, uh, we can shake it loose. We're certainly hopeful. It's, um, it has been reported out of the Environment Committee again. Um, it's in the Senate Ways and Means Committee, um, which is, it has gone to before and it's always been released favorably. So it's there now. Um, there's a little bit of a lull in the um, legislative session over the holidays. Um, so we're hopeful that it will get taken up soon. Um, I think last session, it was um, reported out of Senate Ways and Means and passed the full Senate. I think it was either January or February, so we're on a similar timeline, um, and that, that would give us some time to work it through the House, which would be really good. That's relatively early in the session to have things moving, so we're, we're very hopeful. Um, Can extend it yeah. to mental illness with these poachers? Say that again? When these poachers do such a thing that they're doing, for joy, mm -hmm. if, they, if they track them down and can't catch it because it's not in their own hometown or state, can you delve deeper into the mental state and you know, animal cruelty um, to get them off? To I, a stiffer penalty? So I'm not totally sure I understood the question, but it sounded like you were asking about um, someone who committed a poaching crime in Massachusetts right. and then left the state. Is that the question? Well, yeah, because you said that you, you, even though they do it in our state, yeah. <coughs> you can't catch them in their state. So even if they're caught in Massachusetts and we do, um, and charges are brought, even if they're convicted in Massachusetts and they lose their license in Massachusetts, so they, their hunting <coughs> license has been revoked, even if they return to their home state, they can still apply for a hunting license in their home state or if they have one, their license can be maintained because there is no communication across the state lines. Um, and I, I'm not aware of a network that um, applies um, but specifically to say, animal cruelty, say, which sounds like maybe what you were getting at. Yeah, the, yeah I'm not aware of a network like that. Um, the only one I know of is this Wildlife Violator Compact. And, and the reason it was founded is because, it was founded by uh, some of the states out west, the really massive states out west, um, because they had such an issue with people crossing those state lines. And all the states, even states on the smaller side like Massachusetts, we just don't have enough enforcement um, officers to patrol the amount of space that we have. Um, so our um, environmental police officers in Massachusetts do incredible work, but they just can't be everywhere at once. They're trying to patrol. Well, I understand that, but what I'm saying is to bring it, to push it so that it goes into effect. Ask the state or Senate, you know, to delve deeper into this particular person who continue violates, you know, to delve deeper into their mental state. Mm -hmm. If they are mentally unstable, that means that there, you know, could be cruelty to the other animals besides the devotion. Yeah, I think that might be some. Yeah, I think that might be an issue that law yeah. enforcement could look into. Yeah. But it's um, yeah, it's not a, a portion of this legislation. Yeah. All right. Any other poaching penalties question? Compact questions? Yeah. Is there so you say someone's poaching an animal? Because um, I've seen signs basically, which really shocked me. Um, might just be my naivety in the US um, <laughs> that people do boat hunting here. Yeah. So. Is there a, a way that they check whether people are actually efficient at killing animals? 
and B, do they have to chase the animal to ensure that it's actually been killed efficiently? Mm -hmm. what yeah, so poaching is the illegal killing or harming of wildlife. So if you're using methods that are legally allowed um, in the time frame where they are allowed, because we have hunting seasons for different animals, which include different methods, different species, um, so it's when you fall out of those parameters that it qualifies as poaching. Okay. So bow hunting in season with a with bows where that is allowed um, wouldn't qualify as poaching, so it wouldn't be impacted by this. If you were using a bow out of season or on a species where it's not allowed, then it would qualify as poaching. Um, so it's a it's a, it's a um, fairly limited term. It's just that it, when it's illegal. Um, so I'll shift to talking a little bit about plastic bags now. Um, so single-use plastic bags um, have been a hot topic in Massachusetts in the last few years, which has been really exciting to watch. Um, there's an organization called the Mass Green Network that has um, formed in the last few years and has been um, really instrumental in sharing resources and information from municipality to municipality. Um, and, and many, many dozens of uh, local laws have been passed uh, with their support. Um, they basically are like a collective of advocates and organizations that support um, the um, limiting of single-use plastic bags. So these plastic bags, um, they're not the only plastic-related issue. Um, all plastic pollution is problematic, but um, these are one where um, communities in Massachusetts have really stood up to take action. And there's been some similar action on uh, plastic bottles that have followed the plastic bag trend, but this is really where we've seen the most progress. And so I think we're at about 60 municipalities throughout the state that have passed these plastic bag laws. And so they limit the, um, the application uh, and availability of plastic bags, um, and every single one is a little bit different um, based on the how thick the plastic bags are um, and, uh, and and where they can be available. For example, in some towns and cities, um, uh, the limitation only applies to like the big box stores, for example, to not put um, too much of a burden on sort of mom and pop style stores. But every single one is a little bit different. And that's one of the reasons why even um, the folks that have opposed these efforts at the local level um, are, are leaning towards supporting, if not actually supporting, uh, a statewide effort so that we can um, apply a standard uniformly throughout the Commonwealth. Because right now, tracking those 60 different uh, laws is, is tricky. Yeah. Has there ever been a study on plastic versus paper? Because I mean, I know paper isn't as dangerous, but mm -hmm. we're talking about harvesting trees and yeah. the wildlife again into their territory. Has there ever been a study where it proves one way or another what's, what's good, what's bad? Or um, relating to animals specifically, or just generally from like an environmental perspective? Um, well, from, for, for animals also. I mean, yeah. You know, you're in the environment, you're going to affect the animals if you harvest sure. the trees. Has there ever been a study on what? I'm not aware of a study that's specific to animals, but I know that the, uh, there have been studies um, about the uh, pros and cons of the, of the single-use plastic versus the paper bags, and the environmental organizations largely come out in favor of paper versus plastic. Um, and when we look at this from an animal uh, perspective, we're looking, um, on the larger scale, we're looking at uh, plastic bags that um, entangle uh, wildlife. So um, we see um, instances of animals getting caught in these plastic bags. That's often portrayed with marine animals, but it's not exclusive to marine. Um, the Animal Rescue League of Boston um, rescued a cat last year that was entailed in a plastic bag, um, and it was twisted so tightly around her neck that um, she was suffering very significantly, and they were able to rescue her, but it was a very difficult process. Um, she was so entangled in this plastic bag, and we see that a lot with wildlife as well. Um, I've talked to a number of wildlife rehabilitators, and um, they do get animals that are brought in from these entanglements. But the other issue is ingestion. So you see the photo that's up here now, that's of a turtle that's eating a plastic bag. So you've probably seen images like that before, um, and, and it is horrifying to see. Um, and there has been um, a line of thought that the turtles are confusing these plastic bags with jellyfish, which is a common species that they're eating. Um, but there has been a study, uh, I've just seen one study um, out so far that's, um, that, that seems to be um, finding that, that there is a, um, a taste or a scent that the plastics are emitting um, 
that is also attracting wildlife to them. So that could be another aspect at play. Seems like it's a little too early to tell for sure. Um, but that's with the, char the charismatic megafauna, if you will, the big animals that we see that are adorable, that we um, you know, are very concerned about. But there are other issues associated with plastic, and that's the microplastics, because as this plastic bag starts to break down, which it takes a very long time, but as it does, you get these pieces of microplastic, and those are being ingested by smaller and smaller organisms as they break down. Um, and that could really be an issue even for humans when you think about um, shellfish that are eating these tiny pieces of plastic because then those shellfish are things that people are eating. And um, you see on some of these, with these, some of these smaller organisms, there have been studies that have shown that um, uh, the, the microplastics are causing concentrations of certain types of pollutants or skewing sex hormones. And so there's a lot of potentially scary stuff happening with these microplastics. Um, and so by limiting plastic bag uh, proliferation, by passing these local plastic bag laws, um, that's one of the ways we can raise awareness about these issues generally, but also try to help keep some of these plastic bags from entering our natural environment. Um, and so this has been a, an issue that uh, has gotten a, a good amount of attention at the state level, especially this legislative session, because of all the progress that's been done at the local level. Um, so I'm excited to see how that continues to progress. It's also been assigned to the um, Environment Committee at this hearing just a few weeks ago. Um, and it hasn't been released yet, but I'm still hopeful. Any questions on that? So I'm just going to run through the slides that have them on here again um, so we can pick which ones we most want to delve into. Um, is anything jumping out of anyone that really want? Yeah, I'd love to. Is that what you wanted to do? What? Okay. She said puppy mills. Oh, I was okay. going to say the, the breed-based Okay, let's do, let's do those two, and then we'll take it from there, see where we are in time. All right, um, I'm going to start with the breed and then shift to the puppies, uh, the puppy mill. Um, all right, so, um, <laughs> There is legislation that has been filed that uh, would require homeowners and renters insurance companies uh, to not discriminate based on the breed of a dog owned by a policyholder. Right now, homeowners and renters insurance companies may cancel, deny, charge higher rates for folks based solely on the breed of dog that they own. Um, if you remember a number of years ago, there was state legislation that passed and was signed into law that prohibited municipalities from discriminating based on breed. Um, and that was a huge step in the right direction, but as it seems like at least some of you have uh, firsthand experience with, um, insurance companies are still doing that discrimination. Um, so it is our hope that if this bill can pass, that um, people will face less of a burden Um, right now, unfortunately, tragically, we hear these stories of people um, that can't afford insurance. So they're either going without insurance or um, they have to make the choice between um, their home and their beloved pet. And uh, sometimes that means surrendering um, a you know, family's pet to a shelter or a rescue because they can't have them. Um, and it's really putting a, a, an unnecessary burden on our shelter and rescue system, some of which are municipal shelters burdening taxpayers um, because of this insurance discrimination. Yeah. <coughs> they pick a certain breed, obviously, I'm, I don't know what I'm thinking. Are they picking that one breed that everyone has the better? You know, every insurance company, <laughs> <laughs> every insurance company has a, um, a different list. Um, and unfortunately, the majority of insurers here in Massachusetts do have some list. It is difficult to get an exact copy of the list, but they, the, the, the dogs that we hear about being discriminated against, sometimes it's pit bull type dogs, sometimes it's German Shepherds, sometimes it's Chows. Uh, the list really, Jack Russells, it, you know, it goes on and on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I haven't heard of them being on any list. Um, they shouldn't have any cases, though. That's, that's the truth of the matter. Any dog. <laughs> Some of the campgrounds, oh, you know, okay. I mean, travel, and some of the campgrounds, they had three restrictions on the bus. Okay. 
Well, um, unfortunately, you know the um, the folks that that are supporting this insurance discrimination, they they point to what they see as bite statistics. But unfortunately, those statistics um, they don't hold up under scrutiny because of the way that um, dog bites are typically reported. So in Massachusetts, we have dog bite reporting forms, um, but the folks that are filling out that form uh, are you know potentially a responding police officer possibly the victim, um, and it's not necessarily someone who can make a judgment on the breed of dog. And that's because even experts can't make judgments on the breed of a dog based on the way the dog looks. It is just not possible. There have been studies that have been done of shelter directors, people that have incredible amounts of experience with you know, a broad set of dogs, and they still get it wrong a lot of the time. And that's because it's just so impossible. So these are flawed statistics to begin with, and any dog is potentially capable of biting, and this is potentially putting people um, at risk because you're making these determinations just based on the way a dog looks and not based on that dog's personal history. Um, and so this, there's nothing in this bill that would prohibit discrimination against a, a, um, a policyholder with a dog that has a history of biting. Um, so that would still that would still be allowed because then you've shown there's a demonstrated risk from that animal. And so if you want to deny coverage or charge a higher rate, that's fair. But based solely on the way a dog looks, that's not fair, and that's not doing anything to protect um, to protect citizens. And so there have been a number um, of states that have already done this, um, and it's really hard for Massachusetts to do it as well. We've already seen it as one great step by prohibiting municipalities from discriminating based on breed, and now it's time to take the next step. And hopefully this will make it easier for people to get, to, to, um, to rescue animals, um, because they, 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 won't, uh, they won't have the reason of not being able to bring that animal home to where they live, which is really what we see a lot. Um, the MSPCA has done a, a survey of folks on um, why they surrender animals, and housing issues is such a significant one. Uh, and then also as a reason that they can't bring a specific dog home is because of these types of restrictions. Yeah. Um, 
breed-based discrimination by homeowners and renters and insurance companies. Um, just a few. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to shift gears to talking a little bit about the uh, the puppy mills um, and higher volume local breeders issue. And before I delve too much into it, because I want to um, compare and contrast uh, this issue, I'm going to scroll to the oppose um, page. So these are some of the bills that we're opposing in this session. And as you can see up here, we've got the puppy mill to pet store pipeline issue. So for many, many years in Massachusetts, um, there have been efforts to um, pass what we call the puppies and kittens bill. And so the puppies and kittens bill, it does a number of different things. And it's changed a little bit over the years. Um, it's really a, a good piece of compromise legislation because we have been working with so many stakeholders over the years. This has been around since before me, so I cannot take much credit for it. Um, but the MSPCA has been advocating for this for a really long time. My predecessor was involved in those efforts earlier as well. Um, and the bill does, it does a number of different things. One of the things it does is it prohibits the sale of puppies and kittens under eight weeks of age, which is just common sense. Um, but it is on the books right now. Uh, the other thing it does is it um, updates our puppy lemon law. Um, so if you're familiar with the concept of like a car lemon law, um, it, right now in Massachusetts, um, if someone were to um, buy a, a puppy from a pet store or kitten, um, they could return the puppy for a refund or exchange the puppy. And as all of us know, no one wants to do that. We want help covering the veterinary bills or behavioral bills, whatever it is um, that you need. So uh, this would allow for up to 150% reimbursement of the purchase price uh, because, uh, because responsible, um, anyone who's responsibly selling an animal should not allow for the types of issues that people are currently experiencing. They're experiencing um, you know, these animals that have been uh, potentially taken from their mothers who are too young because they have significant behavioral issues or um, you know, some of the issues we see are uh, really sick animals. Uh, too often when um, a consumer is walking by that pet store window, they see what they think is just a cute, sleepy puppy, but really that's a sick animal. Um, and, and that sickness could come from um, transport. A lot of these animals that are coming from puppy mills um, out in the Midwest shipped uh, with animals from a lot of other puppy mills and you know, sometimes that's a days long journey to get to New England and um, there are very significant issues and we get uh, complaints from consumers all the time that the puppy mills have lying. Uh, the SPCA also gets complaints a lot uh, from people that are facing these issues firsthand and they want help covering their medical bills. So there's puppy level not to do you have any consumer information about, I mean, are you giving any information to the consumers? Yeah. Yeah, so we, uh, we do, we have a lot of resources, um, and we do a lot to promote adoption um, and to encourage folks if they do choose to go to a breeder, um, about how to find a responsible breeder, and in short, what that means is that it's a breeder that's willing to let you visit their home and see the conditions where this puppy is born into. Um, we have um, cards, a puppy mill handout cards, um, with our tip line information, as well as posters, um, and those are things we bring to table and events in Massachusetts, but um, especially my colleagues in the Midwest, um, which is a massive focus of theirs. Um, <coughs> and yeah, it, it's a consumer issue. Um, we need to raise awareness because once people realize where that pet store, you know, that puppy in the pet store window comes from, um, overall they may make the right choice, which is what we're seeing with um, local, local legislators as well. Um, throughout the country, there are hundreds of municipalities that have passed pet store laws. And, um, so basically those um, require that um, puppies and kittens available are from, from shelters and rescues. And it's making a huge difference. California just passed at the state level um, a law that would do just that because there were so many local communities that had already taken action. Yeah. Huh. Um, you know, I haven't heard of that happening to 
stage doesn't mean it's not happening, uh, but it's not an issue that I'm very familiar with. Um, and this bill, um, it addresses higher volume local breeders. Um, right now the number is five or more intact females. So that would relate to the, uh, the mother, which we've seen as uh, being a more effective method than the number of puppies because that's so much more difficult to track um, and because it varies so much from uh, breed to breed, individual to individual. Um, so we've seen states that um, have their regulations triggered by a uh, number of certain growth intact females are uh, more enforceable. What do you mean by intact? Say that again? What do you mean by intact females? Uh, non-state. Well, non okay. Non-state, yeah. So, 150%? Yeah. Yeah. So this is something 
something that is really commonly um, understood um, among the breeding community and probably among um, you know, shelter, shelters and rescue communities as well, um, but not necessarily by the public. And so that's the issue that we face is raising this awareness that um, if, if there is a puppy in a pet store, that puppy came from a puppy bell. Solidify essentially this pipeline for a 
puppy mills to pet stores in Massachusetts, and make it easier for folks to sell puppy mills and their puppies from puppy mills in Massachusetts. Yeah. What is the incentive for a visitor out there to, to buy and sell from a puppy mill versus you know shelter animals? Is it is it more lucrative to sell? Um, I mean, they're running the risk of their business potentially if the animals are sick. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's very risky. successful without selling puppies and kittens from, from mills. Um, you know, the largest pet store chain, pet shop chains, pet supply chains, uh, have made this shift. <laughs> like, well, are already don't make puppies and kittens available in their stores unless they're from a shelter or rescue. Um, and we've seen other smaller local chains make that transition as well as, you know, as individual mom and pop um, pet supply stores. And we actually have a staff person in our puppy mills campaign department that specifically works to transition stores to this humane model. And it's absolutely the direction um, that any, uh, that it's absolutely the direction that makes sense for customers to take in the future. So I think some of this is digging in your heels and not wanting to change what your model looks like. Um, but it, it makes sense to make this shift, especially given uh, the public opinion on this issue, which is overwhelming. Yeah. Um, so on that bill, like, what, what, there's a Massachusetts, like, legislature that's sponsoring that? And do they understand what they're sponsoring? <laughs> it just seems weird that there'd be a representative somewhere in the state. Yeah. And why would they be doing that? <clears throat> yeah, so I mentioned earlier that when we seek to file good implementation legislation, we usually try to find a sponsor in the Senate and sponsor in the House to, um, uh, to take the lead on these issues and champion them through the process. Um, the representative, there's only a um, House version of this bill, um, and the representative who did file it, um, he did not come to the hearing to testify in support of this bill. Is there a pet store in this town? There is a pet store <laughs> in this district. Um, and uh, I have not seen him actively advocate in support of this bill. Um, I have seen the pet stores come out in force. Um, they came to the hearing um, and filled the seats with pet store staff. Um, and uh, um, it was a very long, long hearing. Um, many pet store staff um, went up to testify. Uh, it was very, very lengthy. Um, and unfortunately, this bill got out of committee, which is shocking. Um, you know, it got out of committee, so it passed that first hurdle in the legislative process. Um, and we will do everything we can to keep it from moving any further. Uh, there's a very broad coalition working this bill, and um, I think that, you know, it, Massachusetts, I don't know if I mentioned this yet, but you need to say the United States has an annual ranking of um, state law, and Massachusetts placed third in 2016 for having the most uh, humane laws at the state level. Well, California and Oregon. Yeah. So we got some not to share,
oppose House Bill 3212 or support some of these other bills as they move through the process. Um, and uh, occasionally, beyond the monthly newsletter, we'll send out on a different alert if there is one. So an example of that was when um, House, me, House Bill 3212 was in committee and um, we had about 28 hours notice that there was going to be a vote in, um, uh, and so we you know, uh, jumped into action um, along with our broad set of coalition partners to urge people to speak out to their state legislators, whether or not they were on this committee, to just raise awareness about how bad this bill was, um, to try to prevent it from getting out of committee. And thanks to advocates like you, um, we almost did. I mean, it got fairly close, which is unusual in Massachusetts. Usually, um, often the, uh, uh, the bill is taken up for a vote and it's, um, there's only support for it. So it meant a lot to sway people to vote against, um, to vote against this bill in the committee. And there will be more opportunities to, um, to speak out and to help kill this bill through this uh, legislative session. So I will look to you all to take action on those. Okay, so that delves into the puppy mill issue. We're at 1140. So I'm going to um, I'm going to go through the rest of the slide and we can circle back to some of the legislation if we have some more time at the end or take questions. Okay, so the next, and we started talking about this already, is uh, ways to get involved. So thank you to everybody who signed up here. Um, you'll start to hear from me occasionally, but not too often. <laughs> um, and uh, we can use your help so much, um, not just in the State House. If you can come, we do have events that are at the State House, like a lobby day, for example, um, or a legislative hearing, which um, we're done with the hearing process for this legislative session, so they'll start up again in 2019. But there are still some times when um, we can really use bodies on the ground at the, at the State House. So I would keep you posted about those opportunities. Um, but other things you can do that are tremendously effective are calling your legislators or meeting with them in district. So often state legislators will have um, either a local office or they'll have district in district coffee hours or things like that where you can meet up with them nearby without having to make the trek to Boston. Um, and starting to develop a relationship, a personal relationship with your, your state legislators your state senator or state representative is incredibly meaningful. It's probably the most powerful thing you can do to help advocate for animals um, is building those relationships so that they think of you when they think of animal legislation and they, they remember that there are these humanely minded voters in their district. So this, this is a huge tool um, and we need people like you, animal lovers, um, to, to reach out to start building those relationships and forming those connections. Um, and so we will uh, reach out to you when there are opportunities, specific opportunities, calls to action, um, to email or call your legislator. Overwhelmingly, making the phone call is very valuable. Um, sending an email can be helpful, um, but usually making that phone call is what sets us apart. And, and that is something that <coughs> advocates throughout Massachusetts and throughout the country um, are, are, are doing, and it's making a difference. Uh, an example of that from recent history, although it's not state specific, was um, some of you may have seen um, the recent announcement that uh, the United States was um, no longer going to prohibit trophies from elephants coming into the United States. And so within, what, 24, 36 hours of that initial announcement, the public outcry was so deafening that you may have seen that Trump tweeted uh, saying that he was going to uh, stand back on that decision and uh, reconsider, reevaluate um, that initial idea. And so it's not, it's not a done deal yet. We still need to keep advocating to protect these iconic species that are threatened. Um, but that gives you, on a, on a large scale, the idea of what your collective voices can do. We can really, we can really have an impact. So typically, um, typically when you call, you will either get a voicemail or you'll get a staff person. Um, not exclusively, but typically that's what's going to happen. Their, their job is they want to document if you call them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So usually what we recommend when folks call is usually we tell them you're probably going to speak with a staff person or leave a voicemail. And what 
we recommend is that you state your name and the town that you live in so they know you're a constituent. Yeah. And then to say that, you know, as a constituent who cares about animals, please do facts and not, not go too long. Reasoning why. <laughs> We, we always try to provide um, more information than we could need. Um, so usually we have like some, you know, fact sheet that we link to or FAQs. Things that you brief is that what you prefer, or if you're knowing them and that the support of your patient. Well, it depends on the circumstance, right? So if there's like an impending vote and they're they're maybe just tallying people that are saying vote yes, yes. people that vote no. So then that's a situation where it's just saying, you know, my name, my constituent, please do that. That's probably sufficient. But when we talk about this, um, this broader concept of building relationships, that's where having those longer depth conversations can be really useful. And in, in districts, maybe meeting, or even at the state house. But I wouldn't. Um, but, but staff are still incredibly important. So building relationships not only with the, the legislators themselves, but also with their staff, um, can be a huge difference um, because they often have the fear of the. Well, and usually they have someone who's responsible for constituent services, so there would usually be a single, maybe two, but usually one would go to for um, for you as a constituent to reach out to. And then they might have um, someone uh, at the state house that works specifically on you know, this type of legislation, or you know, they might break it up by categories or something. So there might be like, you know, someone who's responsible for animal legislation as well. So there might be two points of contact for you. Depends on the office, um, but starting to develop that relationship is really lay the foundation for success. Right. So, um, <clears throat> I know you're all doing incredible work with the and I, I don't want to take time away from that, but I'd love to, uh, when you're not volunteering with Bay Pad, um, to have your help, especially with these um, important pieces of state legislation, and um, to work on local legislation. We talked a little bit about these local puppy mill bills. Um, local communities are also taking action on the plastic bag issue that we talked about, but also um, on elephants and circuses. So if we get this done in this legislative session, uh, I won't circle back with you to ask for that. Uh, that would be wonderful if we get this done at the state level. But if not, then that's another opportunity for action. And when we are talking about passing local laws, we, we really look to you as animal advocates in the community to take ownership of this, these issues. And we have toolkits that we put together um, to guide you through that process. And so I'm happy to send those around to you so you can get a sense of what those look like. Um, if you're interested in engaging at a higher level, we have these higher level volunteer positions. We have a district leader role and a state council role. Um, in Massachusetts, a lot of the work we do is over overlaps. Um, but the district leader's role is to uh, particularly serve as a point person for our federal affairs team in your congressional district. So it's tied to your federal um, representative. And uh, those are uh, folks that we look to to pick up the phone when you need that call me to that federal, um, that federal lawmaker. Um, and we look to them to serve as an ambassador to the Canadian society and their community. Um, with the state council, they're usually a little bit more focused on the state level work than the federal work, but it's definitely um, juggling both of those, as well as sometimes local legislation. Our district leader in Cambridge uh, was one of the folks that was instrumental in passing the Cambridge Puppy Mill Bill. Um, we have an incredible team of about two dozen um, high level volunteer leaders in Massachusetts already, and we're always looking to grow, so we take applications on a rolling basis if you're interested in either of those programs. Um, here are some great photos of some of our volunteers in action. Um, you can see, actually, I put you in this. Oh. That's you testified on the um, research animal bill. Um, so thank you again for being there. Uh, the photo in the middle is um, a ton of volunteers, including some of our volunteer leaders that were came to Boston the day that we submitted signatures um, for the question three ballot initiative petition. So this was. This was the July submission, not the winter submission, so it was the second round of signatures. Um, and then up in the right hand corner is Dorothy, she's one of our um, district leaders, and she's tabling for the Humane Society at the Green Arts Festival, um, which is in the district of actually the, um, the chairman of the, um, the committee that's, um, that's considering the breed specific, or the, yeah, the breed specific insurance discrimination issue. So that was one of the issues she was highlighting when she was tabling there. 
And then up on the left-hand corner is a photo of Wayne. He came to visit. Um, he was in Boston uh, just very briefly. And so we um, brought a number of volunteer leaders in to, to chat with him for a little while about um, some of what we're working on at the state and federal level. Uh, here's a little more about our district leader position. Um, I would encourage you all to consider applying. It's um, really an incredible position. And it, provides you with a lot of um, resources from headquarters. Um, there's trainings uh, on animal advocacy generally, as well as access to um, specific webinars and other resources. Uh, here's some of our priority federal legislation, and those are things that our district leaders in particular engage on. Um, and more about the district leader role. Here are our congressional districts, so we have nine. Um, we have district leaders, um, we have co-district leaders in a number of districts, and we're always looking to bring more folks on. There is also a deputy district leader role, um, so that's a good way for some folks to uh, first start engaging and then maybe work their way up to a district leader position as one opens up, or if you want to um, be co-district leaders within a certain district. Um, and we have all of them but one filled. Um, we're looking for a district leader. We have at least one district leader in all of the districts except for um, on the North Shore. So if you know anyone up there in particular, that would be wonderful. And the other program we have is our state council program. Um, so both of these are fairly flexible in terms of the amount of time that's devoted. Usually they ask for between an hour and three or four hours a week, but um, we know that everyone's schedule is different and it might vary throughout the year, and so we are very understanding of that. Um, one of the things that sets the state council um, member role apart is that there is a um, philanthropic uh, aspect to that as well. And here's a summary of what I talked about a little bit. Um, both of these roles work closely with me as the state director, but also work with our teams Headquarters. We have a district, district leader specific staff at headquarters and state council specific staff as well. And so there's a lot of support. Um, we also get access to a network of these volunteers from across the country and to learn what's working in their states, what they've tried, um, and, and how they're putting specialists some of these local toolkits to use. The 301 training is one of our, um, it's a really incredible resource to folks. We, um, our district leaders, state council members, and interns take that course, and it, it's a really good primer on advocacy generally. I'm um, going more into depth than I did today here. And here's the obligatory inspirational quote. Um, thank you all for signing up here. Um, I really appreciate it, so I'll follow up with um, links to some of these resources. Um, and including the applications to um, apply to be a state council uh, member or a district leader if you're interested, which I hope you are. Um, so let's see, how are we doing on time? It is 11.48, so happy to take any questions and um, just to stick around for a little while after. I just want to delve into any of the other state legislation that we didn't talk about yet. Yeah. Uh, it's maybe, on, maybe beyond your scope. Locally in our town and some of our surrounding towns, we've got some issues up on us, mm -hmm. animal neglect, mm -hmm. shelters, uh, hoarding issues. Uh, with, with our regulatory environment, we have inspectors that are supposed to be watching these, but sort of blindsided of everybody that things got really out of control. Does Humane Society U.S. or anybody locally do anything like, like uh, random searches of facilities or, or like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or help those tobacco clients, you know, selling to you or something like that with sting operations. I know you showed one picture with a sting operation. So, yeah, so the Humane Society of the doesn't have any law enforcement authority, so we can't go in um, to inspect facilities. We do provide education and resources and when asked by law enforcement, under certain circumstances, we will go in and with them, which is the case for the, uh, the Great Danes um, in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. Um, but because we have no law enforcement authority, that there's never an instance where we can go in on our own. Now that is different from the MSPCA and the Animal Rescue League of Boston, who do have law enforcement authority. Um, however, it is um, the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources that uh, is 
ultimately responsible for setting the regulations for shelters and rescues. They're in the process of updating those, and hopefully there, in the future, will be more um, resources allocated to enforcement, but that is always, um, always an area that needs improvement in every state. So that's a piece of federal um, legislation, and uh, it's actually uh, Catherine Clark, who's a, from Massachusetts, is the lead sponsor on that in the U.S. House. She formerly was a state legislator, and so she was involved in some of our animal protection legislation at the state level. Um, so the Federal Pause Act, um, it, uh, it protects um, uh, domestic violence survivors and allows them to bring pets into shelters. To way to further some of the work that she did at the state level. Um, and some of that state work uh, is also being furthered at the state level through the um, Clause 2, which is different even though they have the same acronym. Clause 2 is the state level legislation that's an omnibus animal cruelty issue. And it addresses um, uh, reporting of abuse. There's a crop reporting requirement that would be established by Clause 2, the state legislation so that um, folks who are responsible for reporting cruelty for um, vulnerable human populations <coughs> also report animal cruelty and vice versa. Okay. Well, thank you everyone so much for being here. I really appreciate your support, your interest. Thank you for coming. I will follow up with some of these next action items. Um, and I'll stick around to answer any other questions. Bye.